Welcome all, and thank you for joining today's webinar, ADRI webinar. My name is Matt Holdstock, and I'm an enologist at the ADRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the ADRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. In this session today, we will be looking at extending the shelf life of canned wines. But before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders to anyone who is new to the Atterbury webinar program. If you would like to provide a comment or ask a question throughout, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar. Type in your question and click send to send it through. We'll be holding a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but feel free to send in your questions at any stage throughout the presentation. A reminder also that this session is being recorded and you will be emailed a link to view the recording on the Adorize YouTube channel. For anyone who's just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is extending the shelf life of canned wines and it's a great pleasure to welcome Neil Scrimmager from the Australian Wine Research Institute today. Neil joined Adabri in 2010 and currently works as the senior project scientist heading up the project team within the Adabri's commercial services. Neil has been involved in a wide range of commercial projects spanning all elements of the wine industry. For the past two years, Neil has led an industry uh, consortium project focused on the development of commercial canned wine products. So Neil, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Matt. Let's share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, focus of the presentation this morning, it's essentially a, an applied research trial, but with a bit of a commercial slant that we've um, undertaken at the AWRI over the last couple of years. So I'll be exploring some of the outcomes of that trial, but I'll give some insights into um, wines in this particular category and format um, in general. It's obviously an emerging, rapidly emerging space. Um, wine can is not a particularly new initiative. Um, I think some people might think that it is, but it's been around quite a while. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the history, but canned wines have been around in, in various formats for over 80 years. Um, originally developed um, in the US, um, introduced in line with the first beer cans. Um, original canned wine um, generally contained four to five wines, so around 20% alcohol. Um, the products in there were particularly unstable, um, but the blame with product integrity was generally pointed um, in the direction of the can rather than the product. Uh, there's been a lot of different transitions and changes in this format over, over the years. Um, 1960s, we saw the wine cooler trend come through. So we got cans in various sizes and formats appearing in market um, along with the use of the pull tab tops. Um, and then in the 90s, we started to see some trends over in Australia um, with products like Ironbridge entering the market. And, th and this ultimately resulted in patents being developed around wine and can and establishment of what's called the VinSafe canning technology. So the growth in the format in Australia was tracking uh, uh, upwards during the sort of middle part of the last decade but over the last few years the growth's actually plateaued a bit um, so generally the format in Australia for wine and can is 250 mil slims um, and can still make up around two-thirds of alternative packaging formats uh, in terms of export volume and that's that was a, as of end of year 2019 and that trend's kind of in, in sort of it's not increased, but it's um, continued since then. Um, in terms of what slowed the growth, it's a bit hard to say whether that's related to restrictions around the patent or some issues with um, acceptance at the consumer level. Um, there has certainly been lots of instances of commercial products in market 
having um, perceived fault issues, um, particularly around stinky sulfur aromas in the product. So aromas such as rotten eggs, um, cut vegetables, things like that um, within a fairly short time frame. So with the products only being on the shelf a matter of months. Um, and it's this kind of feedback that led to a trial being initiated here in association with a number of wine producers and can suppliers. Um, so I'll give some more details on that as we go. Um, the US market's actually grown a lot faster recently. Um, it's seen exponential growth over the last two or three years. Um, this data is getting a little bit old now, but it does highlight the acceleration in this product category. So as of end of 2019, it was something like an 80% growth um, compared with overall wine sales, um, in this case, off trade, um, being just around one and a half percent. So it's coming off a fairly small base, but the, the increase in this um, category is, is massive in the US. Um, drivers for adoption in terms of US and Australia, um, probably the things you expect, um, convenience, um, you know, use with um, things like picnic scenarios, um, perceived environmental benefits from um, higher rates of recycling with aluminium, and probably users trying to um, assess new products. So they're trying new products without having to purchase the full bottle. So it's, it's a way for people to um, understand what they like um, in terms of wine styles and varieties. It's particularly popular with millennials. Um, in terms of the, the wine styles that are driving this acceleration, it's generally lighter styles, um, often um, carbonated, so semi-sparkling or full sparkling, things like Moscato, sparkling rosé, sparkling white. Um, there are a number of still products available in this category. It's still a fairly small portion um, in terms of white and red still products. And they were starting to see low and no alcohol products in a can. And some of those sort of wine-based beverages now have it having additives, so different flavors, botanicals, things like that. So it makes understanding the, the chemistry a lot more, a lot more challenging. So as I've alluded to, there was an issue with um, perceived fault characters with a number of canned wine products in the market. So there's a pr prevalence of what was perceived to be um, reductive compounds, volatile stinky sulfur compounds, and predominantly hydrogen sulfide. Um, so the compound that gives that sort of rotten egg character. Um, as the market sort of developed, there's um, a bit of variability, um, uh, sorry, variability in canning practices um, and new products in this format. So there's a bit of an increased risk because the, the format and the products that are being put into can uh, are quite varied and the way in which they're being packaged is also quite varied. So um, it adds to the risk of um, issues with product quality down the path. Um, we realized because of the prevalence of the problem in the market that we needed to find a way to understand the chemistry involved in a bit more detail and to try and understand whether there are any practical solutions that could be applied to reduce the risk. So we essentially um, created a consortium based study. So it's a, it's a commercial study, but it's, it's sort of in that applied research space. Um, so that included a number of wine producers, both here and in the US, and also can suppliers and co-packers that are also um, active in this format. So a lot of the data I'm showing here today has been generated out of that study. Um, this is just an example of, I guess, how widespread the problem is in terms of the prevalence of hydrogen sulfide in can wine products. So we looked at 16 different commercial products. This is data from a couple of years ago. Um, and we looked at them over a five month period post packaging. Um, now, just for context, hydrogen sulfide, um, its aroma threshold is particularly low. So down around one to two micrograms per liter. 
um, you can see from the graph that most of the products we looked at were um, either around or in excess of that level. Um, some of them we looked at, they had particularly high levels of hydrogen sulfide, um, some up around 40, 50 um, micrograms per litre. So that's um, more than enough to, to put off a consumer if they're hit with that when they open a can of wine. So it's probably fair to point out that, you know, sulfide formation and the chemistry behind that is, is pretty complex. Um, there's still research, active research at the moment to understand all of the precursors involved and the other chemistry, uh, other factors that drive sulfide formation. Um, so this is something that can happen in bottle product as well as can product. But we did see that the prevalence for hydrogen sulfide formation seems to be much higher in can. So there's obviously something driving that. Now, just a bit of background around the can itself. There are lots of different size um, formats and configurations. So both in terms of volume and dimensions, the 250 mil slim can tends to be the weapon of choice for Australian producers. Um, most of the US products I've seen tend to be a, a bigger volume can, um, often 500 mil. Um, but they, they're all manufactured in a very similar way. Um, they are generally a two piece item. So you've got the can body and the can lid. Um, and you can see even with the lids over on the right hand side, there are different um, configurations of um, the lid end. Um, doesn't really affect the um, chemistry that we see in the package, but it does affect um, how easy it is to package these products online. So there's lots of, lots of choice out there, lots of different styles and formats. Um, each one needs its own particular setup in terms of the packaging process. So obviously the outside of the can is aluminium, but Inside that can, we have a liner. So because we don't want contact between the aluminium and the product inside, we have to have a barrier film. So these are often water-based epoxy liners. There's also um, things like polyester that are being used in other parts of the world. One of the issues with epoxy liners is the um, potential um, increase in um, BPA that can come from these type of liners. So bisphenol A is, is a big issue with um, lots of other packaging formats. Um, there is uh, a, a bit of a risk in terms of health, potential health effects from BPA that can leach into products um, where BPA is present in the the plastic materials that are used. Um, and because of this, some markets have moved towards having what's called BPA non-intent liners. So this is more prevalent in markets where there's regulations around this. So um, parts of Europe, um, some parts of the EU and California particularly have moved to BPA non-intent liners. Um, so the barrier film used in those cans is slightly different. Um, most of the data I've seen to date suggests that the latest iteration of those is um, equally capable of um, protecting the products as a, a water-based epoxy. But with any of these packaging processes and formats, there's, there's always a number of different risk factors around product integrity. And I've just got some of those highlighted on the right here. Um, now the can suppliers themselves have um, being very active in defining what some of those risk factors are. So we know that copper and chloride um, can be an issue. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Free SO2 is, is definitely an issue. Um, particularly high levels of that make the wine matrix more aggressive. Um, sulfites are also something that's um, come into vision um, recently. Um, and things like pH, CO2, they all add to the aggressiveness of the matrix. So a combination of like low pH and a high SO2 can be particularly damaging and make the product hard to hold in a can format. 
So we know that copper and chloride can act as um, catalytic species um, in corrosion processes. And I won't go into the chemistry of this too much, but essentially the inside of the aluminium can um, has an oxide film on it. Um, and then we've got the barrier film next to that. Um, we don't fully understand yet how corrosion is occurring at the aluminium surface, but we've got evidence to indicate that that is happening. Um, and when you get things like copper and chloride species present, you can get these corrosion pits forming in the surface. And, and we know from this chemistry in the, in the bottom right that we've got aluminium uh, metal um, present and we've got SO2 present, we can form hydrogen sulfide, which is this H2S. Um, now I've said already that there are other reasons for H2S to be present in wines. I'm, I'm not gonna go into the chemistry involved in that. That's a whole separate presentation, but there are a lot of other precursors that can be present in wine that can lead to hydrogen sulfide formation. That's a background risk. Um, the fact that we've got a can with aluminium um, present that can break through into the product essentially adds a secondary pathway and an additional risk to products in that format. So as I said, we don't fully understand how um, the SO2 is actually contacting with the aluminium. We know that the corrosion and the pitting is occurring, whether there's essentially pores in the liner surface that are giving the SO2 a pathway to the aluminium, we don't yet know. Um, there's quite a bit of study going into this in the US through Cornell University, who we've been collaborating with on some elements of this trial. Um, but what's evident from our studies is that we are seeing aluminium transfer into wine products, and we have seen evidence of pitting in the surface of the cans. So just, just to back that up, I'll show you some aluminium data from, again, it's commercial canned wine products that we've received um, post-packaging. Uh, we've monitored aluminium levels over a five to six month period. And this is, these are products that are taken from the Australian, New Zealand and US markets. And um, we saw aluminium concentration increase in almost every single case. So just to give you um, some context, background aluminium levels in Australian wines are generally around two to 300 micrograms per litre. For reds, they tend to be a little bit higher for whites, um, but we can see most, most products, the levels sitting way above that. And we are seeing aluminium increase over time, it's not, um, it's not consistent. You can see from some of these error bars, there's, there's quite a big um, degree of variability, can to can, and that, that's something we've seen as a general trend in our trials. But I guess the key takeaway from this is aluminium is making its way into the product um, in a fairly short time frame. So it's not the only product where this is an issue. Cider seems to be another one where aluminium transfer is a problem. Um, and there are lots of other products in the marketplace that are um, fairly aggressive in nature. So things like um, cola drinks, for example, um, obviously fairly aggressive matrix, but we don't tend to see um, much in the way of aluminium breakthrough. So we don't see a big increase in aluminium concentration over time. Side is the one where we see um, similar sort of increases in aluminium. Um, and that's the kind of product where we see some similarities in terms of pH and SO2 levels. So they're, they're obviously drivers in, in the process. Now I mentioned pitting in the surface. This is some work we did in conjunction with Adelaide University. So we did some scanning electron microscopy. So what you're looking at on the left-hand side is um, is an electron microscope image of the internal surface of a can. And these ellipses that you can see are essentially um, pits forming in the surface. Um, and we did some X-ray analysis within those pits. Uh, and that's basically what you're seeing on the right-hand side here. 
So there's a, there's a bit of noise there because there are other elements present at these points where we're um, focusing the beam for the X-ray analysis, but you can obviously see aluminium in, is um, breaking through there. If we focus the beam at a different part of the internal surface of the can where we're not getting those pits, we wouldn't be seeing any aluminium there. We'd just be seeing um, carbon and oxygen signals from the, the barrier film itself. So it's clear evidence that there's aluminium breakthrough in these products and these pits are forming on the surface uh, or in the surface of the can. So for whatever reason, the barrier film is not um, completely effective in some cases, not every case, but in a lot of cases, we're seeing that breakthrough. Um, in terms of the filling process, um, we, we also looked at a leach as a potential factor. Now, um, because a can is inherently um, essentially anoxic, so we're not, it's an environment where no oxygen is going to make its way into the package once it's sealed. Um, things like oxygen ingress through um, oxygen transmission rates, which we normally look at with bottled wine, aren't really a factor here. Um, but the effectiveness of the packaging process in terms of things like dissolved oxygen levels um, and headspace oxygen levels um, are a factor, um, but not in terms of reduction chemistry and formation of H2S, but more in terms of um, potential high oxygen levels that can lead to rapid lowering of SO2 and actual oxidation in package. So um, it is important to get the filling process right. Um, this data here, again, is taken from those same 16 products. Um, this is the actual data from the, um, the filling process via headspace measurements on the actual cans. So you can see there's a lot of variation in terms of the headspace that we saw in the can. Um, and on the right-hand side, we've broken this down by the facility that was used to actually package the product. So you can see straight away, some are quite effective at keeping those OLH levels low. Um, with some of them, it's, you know, it's up around so averaging 16 mils of headspace. So if your oxygen management practices are good, that means fairly low risk in terms of oxidation. Um, but if they're not good, then you can see your product fall over pretty quickly um, from oxidation processes rather than hydrogen sulfide formation. Um, and it, this is just some TPO data that we, um, this was actually gathered in the US back in 2019. So we looked at the, both the dissolved oxygen levels and the headspace oxygen levels in some canned wine products. This is actually a steel wine that was being packaged at the time. And you can see, A, there's a lot of variability in terms of can to can variation, but you can also see that on average, we're seeing around two milligrams per liter um, oxygen in package um, at the point of fill and seal. So again, if you're going in with a fairly low SO2 level, that could potentially be a risk in terms of oxygen, oxidation levels down the track. So with all those risk factors in play and trying to understand what we could do to reduce the potential impact for commercial products, we've, we've run a series of experimental trials. So these, these have probably run over the last uh, couple of years. Um, in various iterations. And here are probably the main takeaways we've got. Um, we, we've done lots of these studies in glass ampules so that we can control as many factors as possible before we go into can with products. Um, but we know that when we've got aluminium there, we see elevated hydrogen sulfide levels. Um, we know that we can reduce the risk when pH is higher. Um, that's obviously not necessarily something that you want to adjust with your wine product, but it's worth bearing in mind that lower pH products are more aggressive. 
Um, high TPR levels seem to support um, lower H2S levels, although that's probably um, as a direct result of hydrogen sulfide oxygen interactions rather than anything related to reducing the breakthrough of aluminium and the resultant um, development of H2S. Um, lower, H, uh, lower SO2 levels is, is definitely um, a factor in, in reducing the risk of corrosion. Um, and we looked at a few different methods for reducing things like copper. Um, one method is to use um, a cross-linked polymer, which is um, a polyvinyl pyrrolidine um, cross-linked with a polyvinyl imidazole, PVI, PVP. So there's commercial products out there at the moment that can be used for wine treatments. Um, when we've used this to reduce copper levels, we've actually seen results in decreases in hydrogen sulfide formation. Um, and one of the benefits of using something like this is when the copper's pulled out of the wine, often it's bound to some of those sulfides that can later reappear as H2S. So it's kind of a double hit that it reduces some of the inherent sulfides in the wine product. But by taking the copper out of the equation, we reduce the risk of corrosion on the can surface and therefore reduce the risk of hydrogen sulfide formation. We've all the way through looked at methane thiol as well as another factor, but none of, this, um, none of these treatments seem to really have much of an impact on methane thiol. Its formation, uh, the pathway is, is different to H2S um, and there's not a direct um, interaction between the aluminium and anything else that will relate to methane thiol formation. So it's there as a background compound in wines generally. Um, our chemistry has suggested that, you know, there's nothing else that you can do with cam wines that's likely to elevate that um, as a risk factor. So I'll just briefly talk about a couple of trials we've done based on these um, ampule studies. Um, this one was a small scale canning trial um, we did about 18 months ago, looking at the relative impacts of sulfur dioxide and um, removing copper by the PVI PVP treatment. Um, we also at this point looked at whether the actual storage orientation of the can had any impact on aluminium breakthrough and hydrogen sulfide formation. So I mentioned earlier that cans are available in lots of different size formats and configurations, and all of those have a barrier form applied, but they're applied differently um, between the body and the lid. So often the, the lid application is via a roller prior as a sheet prior to stamping out of the, the ends. Whereas the, the can bodies, the, the lacquers are um, often applied online as a spray and a curing process. So that potentially leads to a bit of um, inherent variability within single cans. So we wanted to look at whether vertical and horizontal storage actually made any difference in terms of aluminium breakthrough. Uh, the answer that it does appear to, um, probably the biggest issue is the SO2. Um, so these starting concentrations of aluminium, um, and sorry, with the treatment as well. So we're removing the copper um, that has a positive impact on um, SO2, uh, sorry, in H2S formation. So when we treat with PVI, PVP, we don't tend to see much increase in aluminium. So we're, we're essentially not breaking through that barrier film. Um, when the SO2 level's higher, there is a bit of an increased risk of that breakthrough. Um, if you look at the control samples on the left-hand side where we haven't removed the copper, that aluminium increase is much faster, um, particularly where we've got high SO2 levels. Uh, and you can see when we look at inverted versus upright, in, you know, there's maybe a bit of a difference there on average, but it's not statistically significant. So removing the copper definitely has a positive effect and keeping the SO2 low also has a positive effect. 
And we've replicated this with some commercial um, wines as well. So um, the treated versions of these, they've all had copper removed using PVI, PVP. And then we've looked at accelerated storage. So I think at 35 degrees over eight weeks, just to see what happened with the aluminium breakthrough and resulting hydrogen sulfide formation. And in almost every case, by one, we saw that the treated samples had lower hydrogen sulfide concentrations after that eight weeks accelerated. So eight weeks accelerated in this scenario is probably equivalent of something like six to maybe eight months on shelf at normal amb ambient temperatures. So it doesn't completely, it doesn't completely take away the risk, but it does reduce um, the issue. So it's not a silver bullet solution, but it definitely helps. So in terms of what else we've got left with the consortium trial, um, next stage for us is really to put commercial products into cans. So we've got a few different formats that we're looking to put products into and we'll look at control versus treated formats with that. Um, one of our issues has been accessing commercial lines where we can run small volumes for trial purposes. Um, so what we've ended up doing is actually building our own capability in house to run small scale packaging trials, particularly in CAN. So things like nitrogen and argon for oxygen management, um, We've got a new dual counter pressure filler that we're using. And this um, image on the right hand side is a can SEMA unit out of the US. So we can essentially run something like 80 cans an hour. Um, and we can do this with products that's got up to around seven grams per litre CO2. Um, we can apply what we believe is best practice oxygen management to those products um, and we're pretty confident that we can um, replicate the best commercial lines out there with this setup and we'll use this to actually put product into cans for the trial and actually see what happens over time with that treatment process and see how well we can delay that onset of hydrogen sulfide. So in summary, a lot of commercial can wines we do see those except um, elevated aluminium levels. Um, it is partly due to the corrosive nature of the wine matrix, but also um, issues with barrier films. Um, we see lots of evidence of hydrogen sulfide formation as a direct result of that aluminium breakthrough. Often we see this within one to two months post packaging, and it can be at very significant levels um, sensorially. We can mitigate the risk to a degree by reducing things like residual copper um, and making small wine adjustments. Uh, it's worth also pointing out that risk and impact is, is very much wine dependent. Um, so it's very dependent on the wine style, the wine variety. Um, our main aim with all of this is to produce a series of um, best practice recommendations for can wine products um, and look at some mitigation strategies, recommendations that we know will work. So things like uh, factors that will reduce the aluminium source, um, things like re removing the copper, keeping the SO2 low, um, reducing chlorides if possible. Um, chlorides isn't something that there's been a huge amount of focus on until fairly recently. And sulfides is also um, appeared as a potential risk factor as well. But as new wines come into this product category, with new styles, new um, additives, uh, especially low and no alcohol versions as well, it becomes even more important that we're across all of these risk factors so that we can develop um, best practice packaging guidelines for industry, but also develop in-house tests that we can use to help industry know when a product will be um, at risk of falling over within the first few months of its shelf life. 
that's all for today. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'd like to thank the um, commercial services team at the ADWRI, um, all the consortium trial members involved in this study, um, and an artist in Cornell University in the US also been very helpful in terms of collaboration on elements of this. Um, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Neil. That was great. If you could just stay on the line for yep. a few minutes, there's a few questions that have come through. Um, first question is, Neil, can you comment on the impact of Redox on wine in cans? And does Redox management during fermentation impact how the wine ages? So we haven't looked at Redox potential for, for canned wines. It's something that we're looking to develop capability um, for in-house. Uh, it's, not, it's not an easy test to set up and it's certainly not an easy one in terms of interpreting results. So I, I don't have many comments on Redox in terms of wine aging um, in this particular format. Um, I think you know, there's enough challenges in understanding Redox potential and wine aging without the can as an additional um, aspect, but it's something we're hoping to bring online relatively soon. Um, we just need to make sure we've got the in-house um, equipment to, to run those tests and provide meaningful results. Okay. There's a couple around the can itself. Um, have you done much research with 150 mil slim? Uh, the, there's a comment about seeing a few of these pop up in wine now. Um, and there's also another one on similar lines. Are you going to look at full aperture ends? We haven't looked at 150 mil slims. Most of our work's been in 250s. Um, we have played around with other size formats. And from a, from a scientific understanding point of view, our main focus has been to make sure that we know what barrier film we're working with and that if we do look at different size formats that they've got equivalent barrier films, um, running the trials in 250, 250 slim versus 500s, obviously there's a difference in terms of surface contact area ratio, but um, there's no reason why we can't apply trials with other size formats. Just 150s is not something we've looked at. Um, and the other question was around what full uh, there's another question around, are you going to look at full aperture ends? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what that is referring to. Um, okay, maybe there might be... Some... Maybe if whoever posed that question can, can email me and I'm happy to fill that one offline. Sure. There's one other question. Uh, there's two other questions here. There's another one that says there's a brand of can supplier that has promoted themselves as the only can that is suitable for wine and have defended their trademark quite publicly. Have you tested all brands of can suppliers and did they perform differently? <laughs> um, look, it's a, it's a fairly sensitive area. Um, there's, obviously, there's obviously patents around the process of putting wine in a can. Um, there are multiple can suppliers in this space, both here and in the US. And um, it's often quite hard to know what barrier films we're working with. Um, I've seen anecdotal information um, around different parties claiming they've got the, the best solution for wine in a can. Um, all I can really say is that if, if anyone's got anything like that to maybe direct it to me, because we can approach other suppliers in this space and put their products through the same rigor that we put the other products through. Um, we're working with a major can supply here in Australia and in the US um, with their products. So there are there will be other players in this space and there will be other products we haven't looked at yet. I'm quite happy to look at them, but um, we just need to start those conversations. Okay, there's, there's another question that follows on, I guess, from that is when will the project be completed and the report released? 
Yeah, so we're, we're looking to put those um, final consortium wines into can before the end of the, the year. Um, and then it's a process of monitoring the development of those. We're already drafting what would essentially come a best practice guideline document for industry. So that will appear, uh, it will be something like quarter one, quarter two next year. Um, but I mean, if anyone's looking to move into this space, um, we're happy to have discussions with them around any potential technical challenges. Um, we, uh, the, the line we've got that we've developed internally is, is there for trial purposes. We, we can't, we're not set up to provide commercial package product through that line, but we can do, we can run trials if people are looking to move in that space. Okay, there's another question here regarding pasteurization. Um, have you looked at the effects of pasteurization on cans? Um, I'm guessing cans in wine in cans, sorry. Look, it's another, another of those areas that we um, are wanting to look at, but we, ha we haven't looked at that to date, no. Okay. Um, there's also a question here relating to PVI, PVP. Could you elaborate on how it works to reduce copper in wine? Uh, it's essentially a, a scavenging agent, so it will bind with the copper um, that's present in the wine. It, it also affects other divalent metals. So we, we have seen reductions in copper and other species. Um, it's, um, it's a means for effectively taking the copper out of, out of the wine so that we um, have something that's less aggressive in terms of that corrosion chemistry. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really wanna go into the detailed chemistry around how it works, but it, it's, it's effectively a binding agent for divalent metals, including copper. Okay, there's another question relating back to the patent, I believe. Um, how does this all fit in with the Baroque patents? Are they still relevant? I'm not sure if you want to comment on that one or take that one offline. <laughs> Look, I'm not really the... In terms of the patents, I think the only comment I would make is that we've looked at commercial products that have been packaged using the VinSafe technology patent and others that um, maybe haven't. Um, we've seen issues across the board. So um, what we're doing with this study is really to help producers that are active in this category or want to move into this category to give them the tools to um, make sure that their products have the best chance of survival on the shelf. So increase that shelf life. Um, there's nothing we're doing that changes what's in those patents. Um, it's really just understanding what some of those mitigation strategies are. Okay, um, I think this is the last question. Is PVI an allowable additive into wine? Yeah, I think if you look in the Fizant's um, Food Standards Code, that, that was added, I think, a couple of years ago. So I think we've said publicly, we've worked with um, a couple of products out of an artist in the US. There are other products available. Um, yeah, we worked with, a, I think, a BASF um, manufactured product many years ago, um, which was Divergen. Um, but yeah, there's... There's products called Clarol out of um, the US that an artist um, produce, and you know there are other producers in that space, but um, that they were the ones that did all the work um, that required it to be um, approved through Fizant's. Okay, there's actually just one more question, Neil. Um, did your work come up with um, an unacceptable level of aluminium in wine, and do, do you have an idea of what would be an unacceptable level? Not sure if that means from a sensory point of view or chemical point of view. Um, yeah. But there, there's inherently aluminium in wine. Um, I say the background levels are, you know, several hundred micrograms per litre. Um, that's not the issue. It's the the issue is whether that increases because our aluminium is breaking through from the internal surface of the can. 
So my answer to that would be the, the absolute level is not critical. It's whether it increases over time. Um, there, there would probably be a point where sensorily it becomes, you know, metallic taste. I mean, you might be able to talk to that a bit more, Matt, from your work with the industry development and support. But I mean, if aluminium is literally through the roof, so we're seeing, you know, four or five milligrams per litre, potentially that will have a sensory impact. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure we've come up with a level um, but, um, in, in this space, and I don't believe we've done any sensory work on aluminium content in wine either. That, um, that's come I, think, I think we've had a couple of inquiries through the years where um, not necessarily wine and cam related, but there's been really high levels of aluminium and there's been a perceived metallic taste in mouth. So I would imagine something like you know, four or five mix per litre might be where you see that sort of effect. But in terms of issues with the concentration levels, it's really whether it's increasing over time once it's in can. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Neil, uh, for providing important insights into extending the shelf life of canned wines. I'm sure everyone who attended today got a lot out of the session. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for joining in and taking part and just remind you that, as always, you will receive a link to view the recording of this presentation on the AdWise YouTube channel uh, within the next 24 hours. I'd also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for the webinar program via the Atterborough Extension Project. The next webinar is on next Thursday, the 14th of October. And we're looking at cultivars that differ in their response to scale infestation. If you'd like to register for this session, please visit the Adebrae website. For those of you who listen to podcasts, I recommend and encourage you to subscribe to the Adebrae's new podcast series called Adebrae Decanted. Um, and you can simply subscribe to this via your favourite podcast app. And we have already uploaded two episodes to this, um, um, to this series already. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next Adebrae webinar. Thank you.